Good afternoon, everyone. We hope you're doing well wherever you are. My name is David Gellis. I'm a business reporter here at the New York Times and the corner office columnist. As part of our coverage of this crisis, we're trying out some new formats these days, and I want to thank you for joining us on this call. This is the latest in a series of live conversations with business leaders about how they are confronting the challenges facing their organizations during these unusual times. Now it seems more than ever, meal kits and membership-based food retailers are having a moment. And today we're grateful to be joined by the CEOs of two of the most prominent. Linda Finley Kozlowski is president and chief executive officer of Blue Apron, the meal kit delivery service. And Nick Green is the co-founder and chief executive of Thrive Market, a subscription-based shopping service for high-quality, non-perishable goods. A quick housekeeping note. You may submit questions at any time during this event using the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll get to them in about 20 minutes or so. And please note this event is being recorded, and it is an audio-only event. So let's get into it. Nick and Linda, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So as relatively young companies, both of you were pretty focused on growing the business, I suspect, as the year started. But before we talk about how each of you have managed the last couple of months, I think it's important that we understand where you were coming from. So Linda, I'd like to start with you. You took over as CEO of Blue Apron a year or so ago. Where was Blue Apron as a company early this year before everything changed? Yeah, so I joined in April of, um, of 2019, so I've been with the company for about a year. And I joined after a strong period of when the company was really resetting from a financial standpoint and an operational standpoint. Basically, you know, after the first major growth period um, as meal kits were, were just starting and, and competition was starting to come up, um, the company went into a really strong mode of making sure that they were financially responsible and um, operationally efficient and reached a lot of great goals of in 2019, in the beginning of 2019, reach, uh, reached um, adjusted EBITDA profitability and stayed on top of that. And it put a lot of rigor into the system and um, really basically built out the team. And so I joined in a state where we had, had, we had publicly stated that we were going to manage the business and focus on some of our strongest customers, our best and, and sort of most loyal customers and attract more customers like that. And I came in as part of driving the growth strategy going forward from there, which we rolled out last August. Okay, so it was sort of turning a, a new page as it were, and this was supposed to be uh, a year about anything except a global pandemic. Yes. Nick, <laughs> Nick, Thrive Market's a private company, so we don't have quite the visibility into your books, um, but you have been growing fast. You've publicly said you have more than 800,000 members, hundreds of millions of dollars in sales. What were you focused on in the first couple months of this year before things started to get crazy? Yeah, well, let, let me first, just for those of the listeners who don't know Thrive, as we are a private company, uh, and despite 800,000 members, lots of uh, people who are not members yet. So I'll, I'll share a little bit about what Thrive is, and I can talk about our focus. Um, so as, as you mentioned, we're an online membership club that's for healthy and organic products. Uh, our mission is to make healthy living and sustainable living easy and accessible to anyone. Uh, and we do it by carrying the highest quality, healthy and sustainable snacks, cooking ingredients, supplements, beauty products, home and cleaning products, basically anything you'd find in the grocery store that's not refrigerated, um, but we carry them at wholesale prices through that $60 annual membership. So our members can personalize the site to their diet and lifestyle. Uh, we ship everything to the door using carbon neutral shift, uh, shipping, uh, and then every paid membership actually sponsors a membership for low-income family. So you know, pre-COVID, we were coming in, growing fast, as you said. We'd reached about 700,000 members coming into the beginning of the year. Uh, we're moving towards profitability as well, um, and really just laser focused on making on that mission, right, of making healthy living easier for our members. So we're launching new categories. We had recently launched ethical meat and seafood on the frozen side. Uh, clean wine was a big one that's been growing rapidly for us. Uh, we've been launching a lot of products under our own brand. So we have over 700 items at this point that are under the Thrive Market brand itself, driving over 30% of our sales. So that's been a huge growth engine for us. Uh, we've been investing really heavily in the mobile app. It's been pretty interesting to see that shift back to desktop web over the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. But you know, prior to, to, to COVID, we were seeing over 50% of our sales uh, on the go 
from you know moms out there shopping uh, throughout the day on the mobile app, um, and then you know really focused on that uh, that magical one million member number, right? Mm -hmm. our, our our business from a mission standpoint, and then from a business viability standpoint, uh, just gets stronger as the membership base gets bigger. So uh, we're going we're we're pining to get to that number by the end of the year, and obviously things have accelerated quite a bit um, yeah. over the last couple of months. Okay. Well, thanks for that uh, sort of table setting, as it were. So, Linda, as things started to change, the world really started to shift. It, it was mid-March for most of us. Can you just talk about the effects the virus began to have on the company, really from an operational and food safety perspective at first? We'll, we'll get to the demand in, in just a couple minutes, but first talk about what you started to do differently in your offices and importantly at, at your factories where you put these boxes of food together to make sure that uh, these boxes and your workers were as safe as they could possibly be. Exactly. And that is that was our number one priority is thinking through how do we make sure that consumers are going to be safe throughout this and our employees are going to be safe throughout this because of course the the unsung heroes of, of what's happening right now are all the people on the front line, whether they're healthcare workers or all the people who are continuing to run services that are critical to people every day, including food. And so that's that was our number one concern. Um, in early March, when we started seeing uh, more and more evidence of spread in the United States, uh, we did actually enhance our already very stringent um, food safety uh, rigor to make sure that we could be prepared for anything that would be coming our way. So we are an FDA regulated facility and we are also SQF certified and have been for the last two years. And that's actually one of the most difficult certifications in the world to achieve when it comes to food safety and sanitation. So our standards are extremely high already, and we, uh, we spend a lot of time making sure that we are keeping our consumers safe and we have traceability of ingredients, et cetera, across the entire supply chain. What we started doing in early March was we started implementing additional protocols that were specific to what the advice was from the CDC and from the FDA, as well as other organizations that were tracking the spread of the virus. And so we implemented additional hand washing, we impl implemented additional cleanings, um, daily deep cleanings, uh, nightly sort of checks on making sure that we were um, using additional chemical substances that were recommended by the CDC on all major touch points, and of course, in enforcing social distancing starting in the facility. Over time, we started to continue to enhance those getting to a point where we had full, um, full requirements for masks in all facilities, um, in making sure that gloves are being worn at all times, making sure we had monitors, making sure the hand washing was being adhered with, and continuing to expand our social distancing work to also educate people on how to social distance when they leave the facility, when they're on break, et cetera. So our main goal was making sure that we could as much as possible keep all of our employees safe, but more importantly, make sure that they felt comfortable coming to work and, um, and putting together a product that was critical for so many people. Mm -hmm. So we were able to enhance those safety standards and kind of go that extra level of depth. We also did start very quickly making sure that our supply chain was buttoned up and that we could, um, we could adapt and source as needed in the safest way possible. Again, no, the FDA has no evidence that there's any transmission of this through food, but we don't believe that you can be too careful in this, um, in this regard. Sure. And yet, uh, it sounds like you've, you've put in the effort and uh, as, as has been the case in just about every company of size, some of your workers have fallen ill with this virus. Can you talk about what, if any, disruptions that has caused inside the assembly plant and how you've managed it when you have uh, had individuals, unfortunately, fall ill with COVID? So one of the aspects of being in a food production facility is you constantly have PPE on your employees. So everyone is in full gear. Keep in mind, we are in a refrigerated facility as well. So essentially the entire fulfillment center is like a giant refrigerator. And um, because we're so cautious about how we handle food and because we're so cautious about safety regula regulations, our teams are constantly in full gear. And so what we're mainly focused on is how do we implement the right policies as quickly as possible to ensure that we've identified any issues, we can um, identify any close contact cases, 
all touch, you know, all areas of high touch are, are immediately sanitized and cleaned. And we immediately put a very strict protocol into place to make sure that everybody is remaining safe. And we're happy that we have been able to, um, to manage this to a point that we feel like compared to what else we've seen in the industry, we're doing quite well and our employees are protected and safe because it is something where you're mostly looking at how do you make sure that those contact services um, stay extremely clean and, um, and, and that you don't have the risk of transmission between people within a facility or to any of the products. Okay, well, this is going to be an ongoing challenge for some time, it seems. Nick, same questions for you. What, what did you do as uh, the threat of this became real, as we started to see community spread in, in California, where you're headquartered? What did you do to take steps to ensure that your fulfillment centers were not going to be a vector for this disease? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not just a important question. It's the important question, uh, obviously. And I think for us, we felt like the stakes were especially high because you know, a primary reason that members come to Thrive Market is because they trust us, right? They trust us for the curation, they trust us for the ethical supply chains, they trust us for the quality. Uh, and of course, as a given, they trust that their products are gonna be safe. Um, and then I think from the other side for us, you know, as a mission-driven business that really you know, views ourselves as customer-centric, but also very stakeholder-driven, we feel the responsibility to our team members every bit as much as we do to our members. So. You know, I can remember getting up at an all hands uh, as actually at the end of February before things really even got going and just said really clearly in no uncertain terms, our number one priority has to be the safety of our thrivers first. If our thrivers can't stay safe, we're not going to be able to continue shipping products to our members to keep them safe and healthy. So, you know, we're, we're really uh, adamant about that. And, and the mandate that I gave to the teams in the fulfillment centers was, you know, what do we have to do, not just to be a safe place to work uh, during this pandemic, but actually the safest place to work. And I think everyone hopefully is trying to reach that superlative, but it was really um, you know, set, in, set in motion for us that, that idea that this, there's no compromises. Uh, this has to be the first, second, and third priority. And, and give so us we just tried a couple to, specifics. What, yeah, what so we tried, we basically tried to stay- center to meet that goal. Yeah, we tried to stay ahead of this, this, uh, the CDC basically. And you know, even before they were coming out with their recommendations, us be thinking, what do we want to do? So whether it was social distancing in the warehouse, uh, gloves and masks, uh, temperature checks, which by mid-March we made mandatory, uh, full station wipe downs during the shift. So actually taking breaks during the shift to have stations wiped down, um, rearranging parts of the warehouse, believe it or not, so that you could have more space around the time clocks, uh, staggered breaks when people were taking breaks from their shifts so the people aren't uh, clustered in the, uh, in the break rooms, um, and then doing full facility clean downs between shifts. So, you know, really going in there and making sure that every surface is clean. Uh, you know, Linda mentioned it, there is no evidence of it being transmitted through, through uh, packages or through food, um, but you can't be too careful. So, you know, we definitely went belt suspenders in every, every possible way to make sure that, uh, that our members felt safe. And then I think for the, for the workers, the big thing that we did beyond just the safety protocol was really making sure they knew that if they didn't feel safe coming to work, whether it was because they had a child that they had to take care of at home, a family member that might be uh, ill, or they might have a prior health condition themselves that, that makes them feel, uh, feel unsafe for any reason, uh, we did what we, call, what we called automatically approved leave. So no questions asked. If you need to be home, your job will be protected. And you know, at a time when so many are losing their jobs around the country, that was, I think, a really, uh, it was a difficult thing to do because it did lead more people to stay home, but it was the right thing to do. And it gave people, I think, the, the assurance that we were doing right by them. And mm. while it may have slowed down our ability to ramp up and scale initially in the crisis, it actually, I think, has made us an employer of choice um, for those who are looking to work through this difficult time. So you know, we've been able to actually ramp up hiring over 350 yeah. people, doubling the size of our fulfillment center staff in the course of eight weeks, you know, literally hiring more people so far in this crisis than we've hired in the last year and a half wow. across our facilities. Uh, I, I want to get to hiring in just a bit, but, but first talk to uh, us about what you've done when, when you as well have unfortunately had team members who have fallen ill with this virus. What have you done? Again, be as specific as possible. Did you do contact tracing in the office? Did you uh, take extra precautions with uh, areas and workplaces where they might have been? Yeah, so we, we've been really fortunate that, and I think in large part due to the safety measures we've taken, we haven't had any known like transmission or people that have fallen ill at the facility. Now with 500 plus fulfillment center workers, there have been a total of three. 
um, uh, that have that have fallen ill outside of outside of the building. Uh, and the key there is is again, you know, having those policies where the moment someone has any symptoms, they're not coming into into the building. Yeah. If they have been in the building, even if it was before they had symptoms or before they had a positive test, doing to your point the full contact tracing. So you know, we were able to within hours of a positive test identify each of the individuals that had any chance of being near uh, one of those uh, one of those individuals. Um, and you know, everybody's put into into quarantine. Um, they're paid during that quarantine, so there's no incentive for people to avoid uh, coming forward. Um, and then we also did multiple tests. So you know, not only do you have to get a negative test, but you have to get two negative tests since there's been issues with the with the validity of the, right. with the validity of the testing. So again, just you know, taking every precaution, taking care of our people, um, and then making sure that uh, that you know we're first preventing any transmission in the first place, which again, we've been fortunate to have no instance uh, in, the, in the fulfillment centers themselves. Okay, well, let's hope you can all keep that up. A quick reminder to our listeners, you can submit questions at any time during this event using the Q&A feature in Zoom. We'll get to them in a little bit. And please also note this event is being recorded. Let's talk about demand right now. I have to believe, Linda, that with most of the country uh, hunkered down at home with most restaurants across the nation not offering sit-down service. People are cooking more. What has the demand curve looked like at Blue Apron over the last couple months? Walk us through what these last couple months have been like and how you have met what I suspect is an uptick in demand for your products. Yeah, that's very true. Not only are they cooking at home more, but you know, we're excited to see people cooking at home more, of course. But part of that is because we're also seeing people respond more and more to the fact that they're able to connect with their families. And one of the unexpected benefits of this time is spending more time cooking together and, and being able to, um, to connect over food. So we're, we're thrilled to see that. So we really saw, you know, sort of towards the end of March and really beginning into, into the beginning of April is when we saw our biggest uptick in the early days. And that was really about a 27% uptick in demand. And again, to the point that Nick made earlier, we had to very, be very careful about safely sort of expanding to that demand because a lot of what we rely on in order to make sure that we're delivering uh, food to people all over the country are the people um, that pack those boxes. And so that's a very, very specific process for us. And we ramped up hiring in order to accommodate that demand. But um, we were thrilled to see that that demand not only came from new customers coming in, but actually a lot of it was from existing customers who were engaging more deeply with the service and people who had previously tried the service coming back and using us again and being very appreciative of being able to get, to get food in their homes. So we ramped up as quickly as we could, as safely as we could in that process to meet that demand. But of course, what we're seeing now is you're continuing to see interesting trends of people coming into the service, trying meal kits and learning about this for the first time as a way that they can actually plan their meals at home, cook for their families at home. So we're still seeing kind of a swing into, um, into meal kits as people are, are seeing this as a, as a new and interesting way to combine with their other food sources to cook at home. Mm. And have you upped your marketing spend at all as a result of this? I mean, given the opportunity here, have you sort of made a push and recognized that there's a moment that you might, uh, I mean, to be, not to be crass about it, but, but be able to capitalize on, frankly? Well, again, keep in mind that what we're trying to do is capture the demand safely. So we're ramping our business um, in that best way possible to make sure that we can meet that demand safely. So that's our number one priority. Um, as for the marketing spend in the very early days of this, we actually turned off any sort of acquisition marketing spend and focused those marketing dollars more on how do we retain and engage existing customers, serve them better, give them the information they need, and frankly, also just help them be more comfortable staying at home, even with tips that didn't involve Blue Apron. So mm. for example, what to do with your kids on the weekend, um, you know, recipes for breakfast, things like that, that just help people adapt to this new, uh, new world. And then in recent uh, days, we've actually restarted marketing um, as we're coming into a phase where we want to make sure people understand the value of what we're providing and also just sort of ease back into helping people 
deal with what comes next because as things start to open up in different places, you still have a lot of people that are very concerned. And so not necessarily, you know, you're not going to see a flood of people necessarily going back into restaurants. You want to help them sort of understand a little bit more of the balance of life and also enjoy some of the things that they've come to a, to realize are the, the simple and most important things in life, which is time with family, time with loved ones, um, and being able to sort of connect and, and frankly, stay healthy. Okay. Okay. Nick, uh, what has demand been like at Thrive Market? I suspect it's looked a little different um, as people went through sort of different phases of their fear of a quarantine and then ultimately the lockdown. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. We really saw two waves of demand and they were very distinct. Um, the first I call kind of the bump, bunker building wave, if you will, or the the preppers, and that was kind of you know very end of February, early March, uh, until the stay-at-home orders went into place. And, you know, that was a very acute demand on a handful of, of kind of specific products and categories. So your hand sanitizer, your toilet paper, uh, your, your surface cleaners, um, you know, you saw during that time, all the pictures of the aisles at the, at the grocery store wiped out of toilet paper. Um, you know, we actually placed a, a PO, I remember at one point that was larger than every PO we had placed for toilet paper uh, in the last three years combined. Uh, a PO you know, is a purchase sanit- order. I a purchase order. A purchase order. Um, on hand sanitizer, we saw an 80 times spike in demand. So we went through six months of hand, hand, hand sanitizer in about three days. So, you know, pretty insane stuff. And I think that affected both online uh, grocers as well as uh, brick and mortar grocers pretty, pretty evenly. Um, and, you know, the major challenge there was obviously just staying in stock and scaling our inventory. Uh, the real advantage we had is as a curated platform, we've got direct relationships with our brands. We're focusing on just the top quality brands. We're not trying to be the everything store. So we were actually able to uh, service that demand pretty well, believe it or not. You know, we got that toilet paper PO, uh, PO filled um, relatively quickly. Now, the, the second wave of demand is kind of during the stay at home order. And that's the one that we're still in right now. Uh, so not as dramatic vertically, but much more spread across the entire catalog. And unlike the first wave, which I think was hitting offline and online retailers probably similarly, this one's really been that shift online as people are trying to avoid going out and replicate their normal normal grocery shopping, uh, but do it all online. Uh, And I think for Thrive members specifically, and Linda alluded to this too, you know, it hasn't just been new new people coming in, but for our members who really trust Thrive Market, they've been shifting their share of wallet to Thrive uh, for their healthy essentials. So, you know, that's where we've had to really scale up on the fulfillment side just so that we can actually get enough orders out for orders for, uh, that are, that are to, to match the orders coming in. You know, hired over 350 people in eight weeks, you know, literally have doubled the, the scale of our fulfillment operation uh, to meet that demand. Um, and of course, really focused on doing it safely. Uh, and the, you know, the overarching thing we tried to do through both phases, um, in, in addition to being a resource and, and, and giving ideas and building community, which we've seen you know, go through the roof as our Instagram you know, rate, of, rate of growth has, has literally doubled and, tr- and tripled at points, um, but also really communicate transparently uh, with our members about what's going on in the back end. Uh, we've been really amazed that people want to understand you know, what are the, what are you guys doing for health and safety? It's not enough to just do it. You actually need to share with people, what are we doing? People have asked, what are we doing for our workers? How are we taking care of them? You know, talking about our automatically approved leave policy and explaining, yes, that does slow us down a little bit in ramping up, but it's the right thing to do to take care of the people that are making all of this possible. So we've been really heartened to see how much these conscious consumers not only are conscious about their own health, but also, you know, wanting to learn and also wanted to be part of the solution. So, you know, one of the first things we did was launch our COVID-19 relief fund. Um, you know, we've raised $2 million in the last two years uh, from people donating at checkout, all going to food access causes. Well, in the last two months, we've raised over $500,000. We've actually seen nine times our typical donated checkout rate um, as members just want to be part of the solution. They want to give to those who are, who are struggling the most. And 100% of that has gone towards grocery stipends for families directly affected. Mm, that's terrific. I want to talk about the supply chain. You both have uh, alluded to it in different ways. But Linda, ha- have you encountered any disruptions to your supply chain? And, and I, I want to look at both ends. You know, are there certain ingredients, certain um, staples, uh, you know, be it food, uh, or, I mean, meats, etc., that you have had trouble sourcing 
to put in the boxes. And then on the other end, have there been any disruptions in actually getting the boxes to your members? So I think one of the things to note is Blue Apron was built on the concept of, of really um, changing the concept of the supply chain. And so we've always had very, very high animal welfare standards. We've always had very high quality standards. And um, the original concept behind Blue Apron was that direct connection to the ingredients. And so 70% of what we source comes directly from the producers and goes into, you know, goes straight into our fulfillment centers and into the boxes. And, um, and that process really allows us to have very, very tight control on our supply chain, but we also have very high standards. So in addition to the animal welfare standards, when you look at the quality of our eggs, when you look at the quality of our meats, when you look at um, how they're actually raised, that's a critical part of what we believe in as far as the, um, the quality of the proteins that we're putting in the box. And so we do monitor that very closely. And we also hold our suppliers to the same sanitation and safety procedures that we hold ourselves to. So as I already mentioned, that's incredibly high. And so we're constantly making sure that that is being adhered to as well. Because of the fact that we also change our recipes every week and we have new recipes coming into the rotation, we also have a variety of suppliers that we carefully vet to make sure that we can move between suppliers um, if there's ever any kind of disruption or any kind of change, even outside of a COVID situation, whether it's just a shortage or, or something else that we need to adapt to and um, make sure that we can make changes to our recipes in that process. Mm -hmm. So we have very, very tight controls in that process already. But then on top of that, we tend to source from suppliers that are um, very high quality suppliers because they've met these standards. So we've actually had minimal disruption in our supply chain to date, uh, as far as just a few ingredients that might be delayed or something along those lines. And we've been able to adapt to it and either adjust the recipes and put a swap in the box or, um, you know, be able to find, work with a different supplier to actually make that, that work um, in general. So we're, we're pretty well um, supplied when it comes to our adaptability. Also, we haven't um, historically sourced from any of the suppliers that have been in the news uh, because of the fact that we have these very tight relationships. We tend to work on the most part with smaller suppliers and, uh, and those types of groups and work very carefully with them to, to manage that supply chain. On the other side of the coin, when you talk about delivery to customers, I think one of the things, and again, we talk a lot about unsung heroes and, I, you know, and the frontline workers, but when you think of all of the delivery people out there that are really, really taking a lot of um, risk themselves to make sure that people can get packages and shelter in place, that's another big primary concern of ours. And they are seeing demand at levels that is, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday type of um, type of demand levels, and so that's been a strain on the on the delivery uh, systems and supply chain there. So we do a lot of work, and we're continuing to try to improve our tracking systems because we might have a box that leaves our facility and everything is fine, and then if there's a disruption in the actual delivery of that box, we want to have more visibility into it so we can catch it early and um, try to help the customer get a new box uh, in order to compensate or, or manage through customer support because people are, are determined, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're depending on, those, on, on the food that we're sending. So that is something that we're trying to work directly with the delivery companies on to tighten that up and make that a lot easier for us to see quickly when there might be challenges and be able to distribute um, some of our distribution a little bit differently just to make sure that we're easing as much of the load as possible on the logistics. Piece. Okay. Okay. Uh, final reminder, we're going to go to audience questions in just a couple of minutes. You can submit questions for Linda and Nick at any time using the Q&A feature in Zoom and just a couple minutes, we'll get to those. I've got a few more for each of you though. Uh, Nick, you mentioned this sort of wave of hiring you had to do. And I wonder to what extent that's been different uh, over the last couple of months than it was pre-crisis. Uh, how do you actually go about hiring and onboarding people when it's frankly difficult to be in the same room with too many people at a time when uh, some people uh, are wary of getting near strangers at all? Uh, I wrote a story for the Times a couple weeks ago, and at one job fair for a, a, a logistics company, people were filling out the applications, but they were told to keep the pen because the companies didn't even want the pens back if all these people had been touching them. So how have you had to change your hiring practices in the last couple of months to adjust to this new moment? 
Yeah, I mean, it's been extraordinarily challenging um, look, from a practical standpoint. I think the decisions that we've made, though, have been really easy because they've just followed from that commitment to uh, protecting our thrivers. And so that's that's meant, you know, applying those those uh, those uh, safety measures that we're doing in the building uh, during the interview process. Um, and, you know, first set the safety requirements and then scaling within those constraints. So, you know, clearly if we're going to double the size of our fulfillment center staff in the course of two months, you're not, we're not going to be able to do that with our typical, um, our typical onboarding and hiring practices. You know, we have one person uh, for people operations and recruiting uh, in each of our buildings. Uh, it's just not physically possible to do that. So we had to get leverage by bringing in agencies. Um, that's actually been really positive for us that we can give them the requirements and standards so they can actually vet people even before they come into the building. Uh, we vet them. Uh, we've been very careful about looking at the prior work history of people um, so that they're not coming from a facility that's actually had an outbreak. Uh, we've been very careful in terms of the questions they have to answer uh, affirmatively or negatively before they even come in for an interview, uh, that they haven't been exposed, that they're obviously asymptomatic. Um, and then all the things that we're doing every day for any individual that comes into the building, uh, they're of course doing before they even come in for an interview, whether that's the temperature checks, it's the social distancing during the interview process. Uh, and the reality is that stuff slows us down. It does disqualify people. Um, you lose some good, some good people along with people that may have been at risk, um, but it's the right thing to do. And you know, had we not been doing that, we maybe could have ramped up faster. Um, but to your point, um, you know, there's a real fear factor. And when people are, uh, taking some risk to come into work every day to serve to serve in an essential service, um, and they're doing so because they trust that you're looking out for their safety. Um, you just have to you, you have to stand up and take that responsibility extremely extremely seriously, um, and that's what we've tried to do. Um, the other thing, which I, I spoke to on the member side, uh, has been really around communication. So sharing with our thrivers in the facilities exactly what we're doing, why we're doing it, what are the hiring practices that we're using. What are the things that disqualify someone from being able to come on board and really giving our existing thrivers the understanding of if someone new is coming into the building, here's what they've gone through. And here's why you know that you can you can still be safe working alongside them, obviously, given all the other safety precautions taken in the building. Um, so, you know, I've gotten on video and literally filmed videos that were that we were sh sharing on kind of a weekly basis uh, early in the crisis with the entire fulfillment staff. So, you know, really double down on more communication that we've had than we've had in the past. Uh, it's, you know, really difficult for me as a leader and I think for other leaders in our, uh, in our team not to be able to be there physically with them um, because we can't travel, um, but to try to do everything we can to still be getting those messages through and letting them know that we're doing the right things for their safety. Okay. Let's get to some audience questions. The first one is for Linda. And Linda, Amy asks, what kinds of meals are selling most briskly now? Is it different taste profiles, different cooking methods than you've seen previously? And it really gets to this question of uh, one that I think we're all wrestling with, which is how might consumer taste be changing in the midst of all this? It's a very interesting question. And, and one of the things that, that makes Blue Apron special is we're kind of known for discovery. So we, because of the way that we, are, we set up our fulfillment centers and because of the way we source our product, we're able to introduce, introduce more unique ingredients into the box and tend to introduce people to new flavors, um, new tastes, new ways of cooking, um, new techniques, whether you're somebody who's an experienced cook or, or just starting out for the first time. So um, from, from that perspective, it's actually something that's always been a hallmark of, of the Blue Apron kit is the fact that you're, you're kind of learning something new in the process. Um, what we're actually seeing as far as changing behaviors, there is a bit of a turn to comfort food. You are seeing some orders for comfort food, but we had actually launched our premium product right at the same time. It's just coincidence um, that, that COVID began. And, and this was an interesting decision moment for us because we were a little concerned. We just launched this premium product. Our customers have been requesting something that was a little bit more interesting, a little bit more upscale for a long time as far as new techniques, um, more unique proteins, et cetera. And uh, we were nervous. We didn't want people to perceive that, that we were launching something at the wrong time, but it was already out when, when this started. So we did a survey of our customers to try to understand if they appreciated this, if they, if they were concerned and if they wanted more mainstream meals um, to try to help them through this time. And, and, the, and the premium you know, meals were selling, so we knew that some, there was some demand, but we wanted to make sure that we were doing the right thing. 
And what we actually saw from the responses was pretty fascinating because people really loved having the premium option there because of the fact that they couldn't go out to eat. And so they wanted some delineation and they wanted the ability to have, you know, one, one thing on the weeknights, but then maybe create a special um, meal on a Saturday night, either for date night or for family night. And so that was something that we found actually quite compelling is that people in fact were looking for more adventure in what they were eating. They were looking for more um, hands-on experiences and they were looking for something where they could really dig in and do something together. Um, and so having that elevated premium experience was actually something that was very attractive to them. Mm -hmm. So all of our recipes tend to be very unique. We're known for a lot of depth of flavor. We're known for the culinary expertise that brings really unique tastes together into a single dish. But that was something unique that we saw was this draw towards let's make cooking a special occasion and something that sort of a celebration moment um, that we feel safe and, and comfortable doing, but also builds connection because we're doing it together. Okay. Okay. Uh, this question uh, I'll put to both of you. It's from a listener, which I suspect is just going to be one of your rival CEOs because the listener asks, what was the biggest mistake you've made in regards to the pandemic? Uh, and what did you learn from it? So Nick, why don't you take this one first? What's been the biggest mistake in all this? Uh, and uh, how are you course correcting to get to the other side? Yeah, I mean, I'll say the, the, the biggest mistake that we almost made was just opening the doors and taking all the demand, kind of no questions asked and figuring out the back end uh, afterwards. Uh, when you're dealing with the kind of surge that we saw, you know, you can get a, a backlog of orders very, very quickly. Um, and be in a position where it's taking, you know, days or even weeks to get orders out the door. So, you know, we are fortunate to see that, see that tsunami coming. Um, and then, and as I've said over and over again, just really go towards the transparency of communication uh, very quickly. We, believe it or not, build technology features that allowed us to um, create messaging throughout the different points in the website that showed what our shipping times were, geo-specific to the warehouse that that member would be served by so that we could be fully transparent with what was going on with backlogs. Uh, we actually at one point implemented reduced store hours to give our, um, our team members time to restock the shelves and get orders out the door. Okay. Uh, still enabling people to, to get their orders in, but making sure that we were cutting off the tails of demand as it were, um, okay. and making sure that we could, could keep those shipping times down. So I think, you know, had but we the question not done was, that- what, The question was, what was the mistake you did make? What was the mistake that we did make? Yeah. Well, I mean, to some extent, we began to make that mistake, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't react too quickly. Okay. Um, so we had points where, you know, on a normal, on a normal uh, day, we'll be shipping an order within 12 hours of when it's placed. There were points at the beginning of the crisis where it was taking us three days, five days, seven days. You know, on the, on the East Coast, there was one point where it spiked above, above 10 days to get an order out the door. So, you know, I think we reacted very quickly, but, you know, certainly that was the, has been the greatest risk. And I think the greatest temptation for businesses is to be too opportunistic versus mm -hmm. really focusing in on how do we do right by the, by the, by the customer and how do we, you know, uh, uh, navigate through this for the long term, not to, not to maximize short term revenue. Yeah. Okay. Linda, same one for you. What was the biggest mistake you have made? Yeah, and I think it's, it, you know, there's a very similar theme here of um, there's a there's a quick assumption of you just want to grab every single bit of demand, but the reality is you need to be safe and you need to be careful in how you do that. Um, I would say the, ba the biggest mistake that we made during this process, which relates to the transparency aspect, is when the initial spike happened, it was actually quite fast. It was very sharp. Um, you could see it coming, but the the rise in demand was um, was very quick right at the beginning, and we had to make a snap decision about how we were going to try to get as much food into as many people's homes as possible. And the way that we did that was actually to um, to sort of simplify our menu and um, and 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 basically make it easier for operations to fill more boxes by reducing the number of recipes that were available. This is very common. Um, in production and something that a lot of companies do during this time. So that wasn't necessarily an unusual move. Um, but one of the things we are known for and we do value is also transparent communication. And we had to make that decision so quickly um, because of how fast this happened that we had to make the change before we could communicate to our customers. And that was something that we really hated the fact that we had to do, but we wanted to make sure that we could manage that decision very, very fast in order to try to stem 
more people coming in and seeing something that that would be a bad experience in the future um, in order to streamline that information. And so we wound up having to communicate to our customers after the fact. And that I think was hard on all of us because it's something that we pride ourselves in. And therefore I directly you know, wrote a letter to our customers tell, explaining to them what happened and why we had to change that, um, that course in demand. Um, which was good, but we had to we had to act quickly, and we had to do it because of the fact that we were trying to maintain the safety of our employees, the safety of our team, and um, and really we're we're focused on long term sustainable growth of the business, not necessarily short term, and so we wanted to to drive the best experience possible, but it meant that we were a little bit late on our first communication. Yeah, I'll, I'll note that it's refreshing, uh, though perhaps less rare than it used to be to hear the CEO of a public company talking about not maximizing short-term growth. So kudos to that. <laughs> um, Nick, we've got another question for you from a listener. Maria asks, what does Thrive Market look like in the future? What learnings are you taking from this now? And do you go public? That's a, that's a great question. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's interesting that you asked that because I've, I've actually told our whole team that what we've seen in some sense over the last couple of months is the future state of our demand and thrive market. Uh, we're just seeing it today, what we expected to see in 2022 or 2023. So it's actually been a terrific opportunity for us to stress test the business and see the parts that scale really easily, see the parts that don't, um, lean into this moment for our mission around transparency and communication with our members, but also obviously providing the, uh, the, the products that they need at a time of great need. And I think for us, it's really steeled our resolve around where we're going um, and you know, uh, candidly accelerated the trends that have been the tailwinds behind our business and our movement all along, which is this shift of shopping in general and grocery shopping specifically online. You, know, you go from 5% of people ordering groceries online in February to 30% in March. Um, and then I think what's gotten less attention, but we actually think is every bit as important is uh, this sort of transformation of more and more people into, into conscious consumers. You know, I've, I've been telling the team, I feel like the moment COVID-19 hit, everybody in some level became a conscious consumer. Everybody's thinking about safety. Everyone's thinking about health. Everyone's thinking about quality. Everyone's thinking about transparency of the supply chain. They're thinking about the things that Thrive has always stood for. So, you know, this very much accelerates where we're trying to go. It's gonna accelerate our path to the million members. It's gonna accelerate our path for growth in general. Um, and, you know, it opens up the opportunity to think about the next next stages of the business, like going public sooner, potentially. Um, but those for us are milestones. They're not they're not destinations. Um, so, you know, we're we're laser focused. However, we get there on getting to that final destination of, of truly achieving the mission of making healthy and sustainable living uh, accessible to everyone. Um, and we hope whether it's going public or being visible in some other way, that that can also be an example for other businesses to say, hey, having a mission is not some bolt on that you put on the business or something that's a liability to the business business. It actually is what, you know, makes you a powerful platform for conscious consumers and what can make a business successful. So that's where we want to go, whether it's public or private, uh, we want to do it at scale and we want to do it as quickly as we can. Okay. And Linda, what does the future hold for Blue Apron? Are you seeing trends now that you think might inform how people cook and eat in the future? We're watching this really carefully and a lot of the third party data out there as well as the, the feedback from our customers basically shows that people intend on cooking at home more. Um, one poll recently showed that 75% of people are more confident in the kitchen than they used to be before and more than half of them intend to cook at home more than they did um, before COVID, even as things start to settle down. The reality is, I think it's important to acknowledge that what we've been through and what we continue to go through is traumatic. And so people are going to be looking for the things that matter, the things that are most important to them, how to connect with friends and family in the safest ways possible. And um, even as things start to open up, it is going to take time for things to, uh, to sort of return to whatever the new normal is. And so we are anticipating a sustained amount of demand that comes out of this. It won't necessarily be you know, at the peak as it shouldn't be and as we wouldn't expect it to be. But we do know from feedback that a lot of people who have tried meal kits for the first time during this time have said, wow, this really 
helps um, helps me choose what to have for dinner. I don't have that fatigue anymore of what am I going to have for dinner tonight. I know it's going to be healthy. I know it's going to be delicious. And it gives me time to interact with my family. And it's taken a lot of that pressure out of cooking um, because it's just, it's easier. And I hope that the biggest trend that remains is we're continuing to see more and more families that use meal kits. Their kids are actually learning how to cook as well because their kids can just easily follow the instruction on the cards. And that just takes a lot of the burdens off the family as they move forward, as they move forward with their ability to, um, you know, the kids can actually cook when things start to get busy again and, and, um, and bring the whole family together. So um, we do see a lot of these trends continuing and we, we see some of this actually making a permanent mark on people in what I hope is a silver lining that comes out of this, this trauma. Okay. Well, thank you, Linda and Nick. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you who joined us on today's call. To find out more about our full slate of digital events, including the next installment of Corner Office Live, please visit timesevents.nytimes.com. Next week, I'll be joined by Mary K. Henry, International President of the Service Employees International Union. And please, subscribe to the New York Times. It's the support of listeners and readers like you that makes our reporting possible. We'll look forward to speaking with you again. Thanks again and have a good day, everyone.